As you may know, we usually preach and teach straight through entire books of the Bible on Sunday morning during our times of gathered worship, but we are taking a break this summer to think about a really fun idea that we're calling paradoxology. And we have unashamedly stolen this really fun made-up word from a guy named Chris Kandaya who wrote a book called Shocker Paradoxology. And if you'd like to pick that up and kind of read through that this summer, we're stealing some stuff from him, kind of taking his ideas, making it all our own, coming up with new content. Charlie and I are for um, these sermons this <clears throat> summer. So this, this paradoxology, this is a lovely made-up word. And perhaps you can hear the two words that make it up. One, paradox. Two, doxology. And it is the gist of this whole series that we should not run from the tensions that we face in life and in in faith and in Bible. Because here's the deal. Usually when we come across some seeming or apparent contradiction, we do one of two things. We think that it has to be either this thing or that thing, and we end up unnecessarily picking a side, or when sometimes when we come face to face with an apparent or seeming contradiction, we run the opposite way altogether, and we get scared because contradiction must mean conflict, it must mean something wrong or something's bad, and we have forgotten the words of the great Yankee rabbi Yogi Berra, when you come to a fork in the road, take it, right? When you come to a fork in the road, take it. Now, here's why Yogi Berra is so spot on, because life is not so much picking either or here and there. <clears throat> Most of life is figuring out how to balance both and. That's the deal. That's what most of life is comprised of, and it's finding wisdom in that balance. And this is the paradox piece of the equation. And this includes life's biggest questions, like why do we park on driveways and drive on parkways? You guys fall asleep at night worrying about that one. I know you do. Why, do, why is it called shipment when it's in a car, and cargo when it's by a ship? What's wrong with people? Are you serious? Like the only constant is change and always avoid alliteration. Like we have to figure out what to do with these seeming paradoxes that we face. But <clears throat> it gets really serious really fast when you bring faith into it, <clears throat> like week one of this series. God needs nothing but demands everything. What is, and how, why, and how, what? Ch- now, Charlie did an excellent job, if you missed that sermon a few weeks ago, I would go listen to that on the podcast or online or whatever. Or, or what about when Jesus looks at his followers and he says, hey, if you want to save your life, lose it. Or what about when Jesus says, hey, you know, what, you know what true maturity is like? Being childlike. And there's one of my favorite <clears throat> Bible paradoxes. It's, it's in Proverbs 26. I put it on the screens for you here. Don't answer a fool according to his folly, or <clears throat> you'll be just like him. Also, you should answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. Thanks a lot, Solomon, or whoever you were. Now, now, here's what I love about this. You don't even have to go search for these. It's not like, well, we're taking an idea here and an idea here. No, no, these are back-to-back verses in Proverbs 26. And to me, that's like further proof that God wants me to consider these things with, with patience and with balance and with wisdom. He wants me to feel deep in my gut what the guy in Mark 9 felt. I believe, help my unbelief. What do you do with that? <clears throat> this is the paradox part of this whole thing, leaning into and exploring the apparent tensions of life and faith. Then there's the second little word, the doxology part of the equation, namely that explorations like these lead us not into final confusion or frustration, but lead us into lives of worship and trust and obedience. This is one of my favorite uh, Theologians from church history, his name's St. Augustine, and I got a great quote from him, and I'm, I'm kind of sorry for leaving it in King James English. Maybe this will be a fan, uh, you, you'll be a fan of this if you're still like a King James lover. Um, <clears throat> here we go, I'll put it up on the screens for you. Uh, this is St. Augustine. Thou art most merciful, yet most just. Most hidden, yet most present. Most beautiful, yet most strong, never new, never old. Ever working, ever at rest. Gathering, yet lacking nothing. Seeking, yet having all things. Thou art jealous without anxiety. Thou changest thy works, yet thy purpose unchanged. Never in need, yet rejoicing in gains. 
Thou payest debts owing nothing, forgivest debts losing nothing. And what have I now said of thee, my God, my life, my holy joy? Oh, that thou wouldst enter my heart and inebriate it, that I might forget my ills and embrace thee as my soul good. Okay, that's fun, right? You got it, you got it. Shakespearean English, that's it's kind of it's kind of delightful. Now here's here's the deal. The paradoxes that Augustine saw in Scripture and in his soul, it launched him into doxology, into a life of worship and faith. And that's the point of this series. We want to look some big Bible paradoxes eye to eye and realize that these tensions, it's not like God trying to intimidate us. Rather, it's God inviting us into a journey of deeper intimacy and faith. That is paradoxology. <clears throat> so, for today's paradox, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, pretty please, Matthew chapter 4. You can scroll and swipe there in your digital copy of the scriptures or in your paperback Bible, however you get there. We think it'd be great if you followed along in God's word this morning. <clears throat> and we will end up walking kind of slowly around in Matthew chapters 4 through 10 this morning, but we will start in Matthew 4, verse 17. Matthew 4, 17. And I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, the ESV. Matthew 4, 17. Here we go. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, uh, if you haven't read the Gospel of Matthew in a long time, um, this is me encouraging you to do so because that'll help this sermon actually make a little bit more sense. But if you keep reading <clears throat> Matthew's Gospel, you'll realize what Matthew's doing here is he is summarizing all of Jesus' teachings into one line, and that's pretty impressive. The entirety of the content of Jesus' preaching and teaching is summed up in the words, repent, the kingdom is here. And that's pretty crazy for several reasons. First of all, some of us think Jesus' teachings are just about being really nice. Some of us think the primary thing that Jesus talked about was just not going to hell when you die. Other people think that, you know, Jesus, well, the main thing that he did, he just told really cute stories that we call parables. But that's wrong. Here, the totality of Jesus' message and life, as we will soon see, is summed up in the few simple words, the kingdom is here. Now, that's strange, period, but here's how it gets even more strange. Maybe you have two flips in your Bible. Go over to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Maybe it's just one flip or or two scrolls or swipes there. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Maybe you've heard this one before. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, right after Matthew portrays Jesus preaching the kingdom's present arrival, he then shows Jesus teaching about its future arrival. So, Jesus, quick question for you. Uh, Is the kingdom here or is it coming? Jesus' reply, you bet. Okay? It's my favorite theological answer. Absolutely. And that is today's paradox. The kingdom of God is already here and it's on the way. That, we got to make sense of Jesus' Jesus's language here within a chapter or so. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of the heavens is already here, and it's on the way. And as somebody who has attempted to be a faithful Bible student for about 15 years or so, this means more than you could ever imagine. And I highly exhort you to go study this more than just this 40-minute uh, sermon or so. <clears throat> Additionally, for you Bible nerds, Matthew uses the phrase the kingdom of heaven about 30 times in his gospel, but Mark and Luke, they use the phrase the kingdom of God, so that it's a little bit different. And then John, the fourth gospel, although he uses the word kingdom several times, his primary and favorite phrase is eternal life, like in good old John 3.16. But the point is, That all of these things, all of this different verbiage, is referring to the same reality. And that's what we now have to deal with. We need to to deal with this for a few minutes. What is kingdom? Whether it's kingdom of God in Matthew, Luke, Acts, etc. Or it's kingdom of heaven in Matthew. What is kingdom? Now, uh, you and I don't live in a monarchy. It's not 1609, right? And if we're honest, maybe this feels a little political to be Jesus's main message, right? 
And whatever it is, only if we define it well do we then have the right to go and approach our paradoxical curiosities about how the kingdom is here, how it isn't here, and why Jesus is so seemingly confusing about the main thing he is saying. Also, um, if this already feels like, like a, a, just a theological side project to you, if it already feels a little distant, like, okay, Thompson, we get it, you like to think about the Bible. If it feels distant to you, just flip back one more page, we're going to dance a little bit. Matthew 4, 23. Let me prove to you why you need to pay attention here. Matthew 4, 23. <clears throat> Matthew writes, as he went throughout all Galilee, Jesus, he was teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction among the people. And that there's even more stuff in verse 24. My point is that you need to pay attention to the definition of kingdom because it's all encompassing. If you read Matthew, it includes your body, your mind, your desires, your relationships, your eternity, and so much more. So if we, if we like wrestle a good definition of kingdom to the ground and then we respond appropriately, we're not simply going to have a better understanding of a biblical paradox. Okay, check off another week this summer series. We're going to find ourselves participating in what God is doing to bring restoration to broken people in a broken world. So what is the kingdom language <clears throat> all about? What do we do with kingdom? Um, a few weeks ago, <clears throat> the first person who mentioned it to me, I immediately... I mean, without hesitation, just knee-jerk reaction. I just made fun of them on the spot. I, I, like, it was just a reflex. I couldn't help myself. I was eye-rolling and playfully scoffing. <clears throat> and I had a relationship with this person, <clears throat> so it was okay. I, I just thought that they were going to just waste their time with such mind-numbing frivolity. And then, then, then I, I found myself sitting beside the beautiful Sarah Thompson actually watching the royal wedding. And I... I <laughs> I don't know if I have to, like, give up a man card for a week. I loved it. It was fun. I'd do it again. Listen, I don't, I don't know. It had me in its clutches. I was, I was totally enthralled with this thing. And the whole time I'm watching, my, my mind is racing. I'm thinking about the pomp and the circumstance, about the 60 million people who watched it. I'm thinking about all of the history and like, like church history and the wars that led them to, like, why they think what they're doing is, is this way and that way. I thought about the fact that the guy who did my wedding, Sarah's Uncle John, is a big deal in the Church of England, and he's even received, received a, a handwritten letter from the Queen before. I was thinking about how he was thinking about it. I thought about the celebrities and dignitaries and <clears throat> how everything was so formal and official. I thought very intently about Michael Curry's wedding sermon, and I thought, in my humble opinion, how really dumb the women's hats were. Now... <clears throat> Here, though, here's the thought that encapsulated all of my personal assessment of the royal wedding. Here it is. I felt somehow that they were acting out what we truly want. We all want unity under a clear royal reign. And this was like a very faint and strange glimpse of it. And we all want that royal reign to be exercised with order and clarity and justice and kindness and celebration. We, we want kingdom. Kingdom is a word about what we are truly made for. <clears throat> Sadly, though, most of the time when we look at and assess the world, we see people taking and grabbing and abusing power rather than employing it wisely. So we see war and greed and injustice and unfairness, and we see power-hungry and bloodthirsty leadership that's seeking to do their own version of kingdom in their own way. And probably, probably the scariest thing about this is <clears throat> if we take a good look at, our, at ourselves and our own deepest motives, we will likely realize that we have a proclivity to do the same things that we hate when we see them in others. Whether it's lust in the name of love, murder in the name of religion, arrogance in the name of confidence, abortion in the name of choice, or anger in the name of justice. <clears throat> when we look at the world around us, we realize that stuff like a royal wedding is the overwhelming exception to the rule. And we know deep in our bones that things aren't the way they're supposed to be. We know that. And strangely, here's where the definition of kingdom gently 
slips in the door. Here's an appropriate definition of kingdom. <clears throat> whenever, Bible, whenever the Bible uses the language of kingdom, it's talking about the world the way it's supposed to be. It's that simple. It's that plain. Whenever the Bible uses royal, kingly language, it's talking about the world the way it's supposed to be. It's talking about a world that is free from war and greed and cancer and hate. And, you know, I, I think I can prove this to you guys <clears throat> dozens of different places in the Bible. But just think about page one of the Bible. Don't, don't even flip there. Just think about it. When God set up stuff the way he set it up in creation, there was a marriage, yes, but that created order was meant to be a place filled with shalom and peace and harmony and joy and love and wisdom and creativity. And injustice was nowhere to be found. Things were the way they're supposed to be. And furthermore, when God created humanity on the first page of the Bible, the first thing that he says to them is, hey, go have dominion and reign and rule alongside me. That is a royal job description. They were to enjoy and further <clears throat> the divine shalom and love as they lived in relationship with God. And this dominion idea proves that kingdom is God, his people, and his world happily functioning the way it's supposed to. Now we also know what happens next in the Bible's story after Genesis 1. Humanity chooses to take its royal responsibility and do its own thing, its own way, apart from God. And, and that includes you and me. Left, left to ourselves, we try to selfishly build our own little kingdoms and make our own puny dreams come true. And this actually, strangely, again, takes us back to the Gospel of Matthew. And here's why. Jesus himself is God's ultimate refusal to let us not do our own thing. Jesus is God's refusal to let us go our own way. Jesus is the king of the kingdom. And that's why this idea is the summation of all of his life and teaching. <clears throat> Jesus is bringing God's world the way it's supposed to be. He's bringing that to bear on the corrupt world that we have made by our own pride. And that's exactly what he means when he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He is bringing God's perfect new creation backward from the future into the present. Now, <clears throat> to reiterate this, here are a few more theological definitions. And you don't have to try to write these down there in the app. If you don't have our, our church's app, you can uh, download that and follow with all of our sermons on Sunday morning, et cetera, there. So <clears throat> here's a few more theological definitions. Graham Goldsworthy is an Australian scholar, and he says that the kingdom of God is God's people in God's place under God's rule. If he would have only done power there, people place power. Man, he must not be a Baptist. Um, <clears throat> so that's uh, Graham Goldsworthy, Australian scholar. Anthony Hokema is a Presbyterian theologian, and he says that the kingdom of God is the reign of God dynamically active in human history through Jesus, the purpose of which is the redemption of his people and the final establishment of the new heavens and the new earth. Jim Thompson wrote a terrible book on kingdom in which he says, the kingdom of God is God's design to have a people reigning with him, like him, and for him over all creation. Now, in some way or another, each of these definitions is affirming our simple definition. God, his people, and his world functioning the way it's supposed to, okay? Now, some people wrongly think that kingdom is just a spiritual thing going on in your heart when you have faith. Some people wrongly think that kingdom is just a future thing about when Jesus comes back and some weird calendars that nobody knows about. Some people think kingdom is just about doing social justice, and some people think kingdom is just a place that you go when you die if you love Jesus. But all of these are wrong because they are woefully incomplete. Kingdom is the world the way it's supposed to be that includes all these things and more. That is kingdom in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, let's go revisit the, the paradox piece of this. Quite literally, how in the world has the world as it's supposed to be already started? How is that the case? I mean, if you scroll through Facebook or if you watch the nightly news, you see so much sad and mad and dumb and whiny stuff that, that it's impossible that this is true, that the world as it's supposed to be has already started. Thankfully, nightly news doesn't get the final word. Good news in Jesus, it's lasting good news. Flip over, we're going back this way in your Bible to Matthew 9, 35. 
A couple swipes, a couple pages perhaps. Matthew 9, 35. And Jesus <clears throat> went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and affliction. Now wait just a minute, Matthew. You just said that <clears throat> at the end of chapter 4. What's your problem, bro? Killing trees, wasting ink, tax collector. Come on, bro. Why? Why? <clears throat> Here's the deal. He's trying to teach us something through the repetition. When he says it at the end of 4, that's at the end of chapter 4. When he says it here in 9, it's the end of 9. And so what Matthew's saying is everything that happens in between chapters 5 through 9 is what it looks like when kingdom comes. These two verses are repetition, and they are bookends to tell us that everything that happens in 5 through 9 is kingdom come. Matthew is saying that in and because of Jesus, God's new forever world has begun. So let's briefly look at what that's supposed to be like. I'm going to start, we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. I'm going to start in 5, 1 and read for a little bit. Matthew 5, 1, maybe flip back a page. <clears throat> Here we go. Seeing the crowds, he, Jesus, went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's Jesus' own paradoxology. He's helping me out a little bit. Blessed are the meek. <clears throat> they get the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, same as righteousness. They'll be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful. They will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. They're going to see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. They'll be called the sons and daughters of God. Blessed are those <clears throat> who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, right here, it sounds like he's done because <clears throat> he's bookended these blessings with the, this kingdom language. But he's got one more, and he actually makes this last one about him because he's the king of the kingdom. <clears throat> Look at it. <clears throat> Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account because of me. Because of your relationship with me, you are blessed and fortunate and happy when you're persecuted. So rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in the heavens. For so they persecuted the prophets that were before you. Now, a couple of things about these verses and how kingdom comes. <clears throat> I love, absolutely love, the opening mind, line of the first message uh, Jesus preached in the whole Bible. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. Blessed. This word in Greek is makarios, it's happy, it's fortunate, it's a word about a flourishing life. <clears throat> happy, blessed, fortunate is the one who is poor in spirit. In other words, blessed is the one who is destitute, deep within. People like that get a kingdom. Man, Jesus, that's not a strong way to start a sermon, right? Look at verse 10. <clears throat> Fortunate are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness or justice. They get the kingdom. Meaning, when the kingdom of heaven collides with the kingdoms of this earth, it is not pretty. When the world as it's supposed to be comes crashing into the world as it shouldn't be, a sacrifice is made by those who want to live well as citizens of God's renewed world. Kingdom life isn't top-down, power-hungry, me-first life. It's not primarily about your feelings, your preferences, your opinions, or your wants. The kingdom comes in and through our lives when we give up, when we totally relinquish our way of doing things, and we turn, rather, and instead to God's way of doing things in Jesus. That's how <clears throat> kingdom comes. This is how it is present here and now by people letting go of their way of doing things and realigning their lives around Jesus and the life that he offers to the point that what you consider blessing and for good fortune and good luck is totally reoriented from the way the world thinks about it. <clears throat> also, uh, sometimes when you read the Bible, you need to think about stuff that's not there. Uh, look at how much pomp and circumstance in these verses, right? Zero. Guess how many uh, celebrities and dignitaries are on the mountain? Zero. And no hats, right? No hats. No, <clears throat> I mean, still, I mean, that's a joke, but listen, no glitz and glam to make us think that we're the point somehow. None of that. It's, it's not there. 
And this is one way that Jesus is making sure that you don't ever confuse God's kingdom with temporal, fleeting kingdoms like earthly power, politics, or popularity. He doesn't want you to confuse the two. So don't forget, chapters 5 through 9 in Matthew are supposed to show us what it looks like when kingdom comes. When the world as it's supposed to be breaks through. And 5 through 7, as you may know, are called the Sermon on the Mount. And this is Jesus' teaching about kingdom life. And he goes on, we don't have time to talk about anger and lust and loving your enemies. He goes on to talk about how it's okay to have money, but it's not okay for money to have you. Right? That's not okay. He talks about anxiety and worry and prayer. Don't forget, kingdom is an all-encompassing category. And his basic point is that life in God's kingdom is radically and utterly and totally different from the kingdoms of this world. The values of the kingdom are completely backwards and upside down from the value systems of this world. But, here we go, here we go, here we go. Lest we think we go create little uh, pockets, little kingdom communes and be totally separate and different from the world, Matthew 5 through 7 is followed by Matthew 8 and 9. And in Matthew 8 and 9, Jesus shows us that kingdom come isn't merely about thinking differently, but also about living and loving <coughs> uh, differently. Look, just look, just for the sake of time, look at the bold subheading in your Bible above Matthew 8, 1. The bold subheading. Here, Jesus heals an unclean, homeless man with leprosy. Now look at the bold subheading in your Bible above Matthew, uh, Matthew 8, 5. Jesus <coughs> shows love to an unclean Gentile centurion. And, and this means king, here, kingdom includes serving those who are different than you economically, racially, socially, politically. And maybe even more difficult, if you keep reading in Matthew 8 when he casts out a demon, it includes active engagement with the powers behind the powers. Like when Paul says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers of darkness. So I encourage you to read Matthew 8 and 9 on your own and see Jesus in action. Because his life and teaching and ministry, in them, the sovereign and eternal reign of God has become uniquely and unimpeachably active. Very simply put, Jesus is kingdom come. But it hasn't come. Don't forget, Jesus is kingdom come. Also, the kingdom hasn't come. It's still on the way. <clears throat> Michael Byrd is a New Testament theologian. If you ever see anything by him, you should go read it. He's pretty smart. Um, and he says, the whole sweep of redemptive history is driven by the concept of God as both king and yet becoming king. We're in a paradox here. God's rescuing reign has already come to us in Jesus, but also there's still a future dynamic and aspect of it yet to be experienced. This is what's behind Jesus' language in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 10. In fact, that's like the ultimate prayer request. Every other prayer request should be wrapped up in this one. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, there are two ways that kingdom is still to come. Two ways that kingdom is still to come. Number one, it will continue to come and advance as God continues to graciously and mercifully save sinners through the message of King Jesus. And he will heal not just their souls and their hearts, but their minds and their bodies and their relationships. And it will continue to come as those rescued partner with Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit to fill the world with love and service and compassion and truth and joy and hope in the face of a world the way it shouldn't be. So kingdom will continue to advance on the horizon of history as we know it. But there's a, another way that <clears throat> kingdom is still to come. There is a great and glorious sunrise that belongs to a day that will never end. There is a consummate and punctiliar and specific end of time as we know it. A day when Jesus will physically return to right all wrongs and make everything sad <clears throat> come un. True, a day when heaven and earth are completely one again, and this entire planet is Eden remade and rejuvenated, world without end, the world as it's supposed to be, 
a world in which all shadows of past injustice are chased away by the dawn of an eternal day, a world brimming and overflowing with shalom and harmony and love and wisdom and creativity, all in happy, swelling praise to God as king. And that's a party you don't want to miss, all right? And Jesus is serious about you not missing that party. Maybe we could even say he's dead serious about you not missing that party. Matthew 8, 10. Look down at Matthew chapter 8, verse 10. After he heals this centurion's servant, Jesus says, and this would have been a shocker, I haven't found such great faith in all of Israel, but I tell you the truth that many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So this is a picture of that final forever day, and it's one that his Jewish audience would have understood. Now verse 12. But the sons of the kingdom, now listen, this is a very sharp term for those who are presuming on relationship with God, who have chosen to do things their own way. But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness, Meaning life in the forever new creation isn't for everyone in some way. It's for those who by faith are in relationship with Jesus. It's not for those who are seeking to construct their own little kingdoms in their own selfish ways apart from God's love in Jesus. Now, while these are sharp words, this only scratches the surface of how serious Jesus is about you not missing forever kingdom life. And here's how I know it. He's dead serious because you can't get any more serious than dying for the sake of your enemies. Greater love hath no man than this than he laid down his life for his friends. He also laid down his life for his enemies. The son of man did not come to be served like earthly kings and rulers, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And because God's kingdom does things backwards from the way of this world, what Rome saw as execution, we should see as enthronement, the king ascending the throne. The cross is not an accident or failure. It is mission accomplished. It is the clearest place where we see kingdom come. When the kingdom of heaven comes crashing into the kingdom of earth, it is not pretty. And a sacrifice is made by Jesus to usher sinners into God's world that he is making new. And there is no other way to live as citizens and ambassadors of God's kingdom than through Jesus, the servant king. If the the cross is the first seed planted in God's new world, then the resurrection is the first flower to bloom. Jesus overturning death is proof that the kingdom has come, it is coming, and it's still to come one day fully and finally. And here's the deal. If we get the gospel of Jesus, especially in the cross and resurrection, understanding gospel helps us understand this paradox. That's why Matthew calls it the gospel of the kingdom. It's good news that the king has come and is mending God's broken world climactically through his death and resurrection. So, what do you need to do about this? How, how, do, we, how do we respond to all this? So where's the, the doxology upswing after this uh, paradox of kingdom? <clears throat> I have four suggestions on how we should respond to this. And what I love about these, they're really, really good. They're inspired by God because I stole them all from Jesus. I, I, I didn't, I'm not smart enough. This is the easiest part of sermon prep this week. Four ways to respond to this kingdom paradox. Number one, repent. Number one, repent. This is exactly what Jesus says in Matthew 4, 17. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is here. Now, this is a churchy word, but it means change your mind about the way you think life is supposed to work. That is repent. So let go of your opinions and interpretations about how the world should be. You you should loosen your grip on the way you think about your lazy husband or your micromanaging boss or your rebellious daughter. You should, you should pry your fingers free from the way you think about money and your girlfriend and your family. Let go of the way that you think things should be done. Remember, if kingdom life is backwards from how the world usually works, then watch this. Our reflex responses apart from Jesus are probably just different shades of selfishness, Okay? Repent means turn from your sin. Turn from your dead-end attempts 
to belong or to have some curated sense of identity on your own. Stop that, turn from that, and repentance in the Bible always assumes uh, number two response here. Number two, and that is believe. In Mark's intro to his gospel, he, he has Jesus saying, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. This is the like verb form of faith. It's a relational word for turning to God, swearing allegiance to, and trusting Jesus alone in all of life. Now, <clears throat> this belief, yes, it means trusting God's eternally secure love for you in the future. Yes, that is part of belief. But it also means trusting God when you have to have a hard conversation with somebody that you know and you're scared to say anything and you're scared of what they might say. It means trusting him in that. It means depending on him when you have physical pain that won't leave you alone and you've tried doctor after doctor and medicine after medicine. This belief includes depending on God in the middle of that. It includes relying on him when you have more questions than answers. That's what believe is. It's the other side of the coin <clears throat> from repentance. <clears throat> repentance is turning away from that which is no good, and believing is turning to the only true good and fountain of true good, that is Christ. Repent, believe, and number three, obey. Obey. We have <clears throat> danced around Matthew 4 through 9 a little bit this morning, but guess what Jesus does in Matthew 10? He kicks them out of the nest. He looks at all disciples, and he goes, all right, guys, your turn, your turn to go do everything that I was doing in chapters five through nine. And this means pursue kingdom advancement in the way that you think, love, and serve. Go read Matthew five through 10 in one sitting. You will see how Jesus' followers are called to obey him by reflecting him. And in obeying, we'll be acting out the king and the kingdom's presence, showing others, listen, showing others that a different world is actually possible. Also, don't expect to get like lots of cool points from obedience to Jesus because the kingdom of heaven is right side up from most earthly values. Sometimes I think we forget that. This takes us to number four. Repent, believe, obey, and number four, pray. Pray. <clears throat> Ask God to make kingdom come in and through the lives of his people. As we follow Jesus, as the Spirit leads us, and as we give our lives away, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Make us the place, Lord, where that paradox is seen and felt. And may all of our repenting and believing and obeying be flavored with a, a prayerful dependence that he alone makes kingdom come. <clears throat> Makes me think of the last line of that Augustine prayer. Oh, that thou wouldst enter my heart and inebriate it, and that I would forget my ills and embrace thee as my sole king, my sole and only good. Repent, believe, obey, pray. And all of these are ways that we live kingdom well now. And, watch this, doing these things makes the world as it should be blossom all around us because they are all in response to and in praise of Jesus' eternal sovereign kingship. It is his kingdom and not ours. And we are called to be living proof that Jesus is the true Lord of the whole world. One day, <clears throat> when the kingdom fully comes... The Bible pictures it as a wedding, the most royal wedding of all time, that will make what happened a few weeks ago look like a grain of sand. And there's going to be way more than 60 million people watching, especially because we're all going to be involved. And on that great and final forever day, <clears throat> we will celebrate the marriage of King Jesus to us, his People And we'll, we will be unified under a clear, royal reign, exercised with order and kindness and delight, because that's what we are truly made for. Fellowship Greenville, this is our gospel, that Jesus is the crucified and risen and soon returning king that makes kingdom come right now as we await its coming 
in the future. And the most wonderfully staggering thing is that he has called us to be a part of it. And that's really good news. And this morning, I hope you believe that. Let's pray together. Jesus, you have taken all of our injustice and sin into yourself at the cross. You have loved your enemies to death and made a way for us to live in right relationship with the Father. And because of this, Jesus, may there be no end to the doxology of our lives, please. In spirit, this new life that is ours in Christ, may we attend to it humbly and wisely as we witness the kingdom advance in and through us and in our world as you overcome evil with good. And spirit, please give us grace to continue to repent and believe and obey and pray as we partner with you. Sustain us, Holy Spirit, as we look forward to that great day when all things will be made new. Father, Son, and Spirit, you're the best. We love you. Amen.